Good day everyone, I am Ms. Riza May Bihitosis and together with my groupmates Ms. Abigail Mornel Gabutan and Ms. Dayan Kinuyok, we are the group 3 and we will be presenting about the origins and growth of cities. So this chapter focuses on the pre-industrial revolution to examine the origins and development of the earliest urban settlements before going on to consider the character of industrial and post-industrial city. With that in mind, let us now proceed to the theories of urban origins. These are the hydraulic theory, economic theory, military theories, religious theories, and theoretical consensus. A hydraulic theory, the importance of irrigation for urban development, especially in the semi-arid climates of the Middle East where the agricultural revolution took place was identified by Weta Fogel 1957, who argued that the need for large-scale water management required centralized coordination and direction, which in turn required concentrated settlement. The principal characteristics of a hydraulic society are that it first permits an intensification of agriculture, second, it involves a particular division of labor, and third, it necessitates cooperation on a large scale. Now we have the economic theory. In this theory, there are several theories that uh, suggested the development of complex large-scale trading networks stimulated the growth of urban society. For example, certainty the fact that southern Mesopotamia did not have many raw materials such as metallic ores, timber, building stone or stone for tools made trade essential. This required an administrative organization to control the procurement production and distribution of goods such as an organization would have been powerful agent in the community and its power may well have extended beyond trade into other aspects of society. Now we have the military theory. So some theories suggest that the origin of cities lay in the need for people to gather together for protection against an external threat. The initial agglomeration leading to subsequent urban expansion. The excavation of a massive defensive wall built on bedrock would appear to indicate the defensive origins of Jericho, but not all early towns have such defenses. Now we have religious theories. So it focuses on the importance of a well-developed power structure for the formation and perpetuation of urban places and in particular how power was appropriated into the hands of a religious elite who controlled the disposal of surplus produce provided as offerings. There are there is clear evidence of shrines and temples in ancient urban sites and there can be little doubt that religion played a significant part in the process of social transformation that created cities. However, it is unlikely to have been the sole factor. Now let us move to theoretical consensus. It is doubtful if a single autonomous causative factor will ever be identified in the nexus of social, economic, and political transformations that resulted in the emergence of urban forms of living. So a more realistic interpretation is that it generated if the concept of an urban revolution is replaced by the idea of an urban transformation involving a host of factors operating over a long period of time. Now we have the early urban Parts. So, as figure 3.1 illustrates, there is an evidence of early city growth in four areas of the old world and one area of the new world. While here in figure 3.2, this is the fertile crescent and the ancient cities of the Middle East. This is the model of the pre-industrial city, so Joburg's model attempts to identify some common cross-cultural features of the pre-industrial city. So like all models claiming a wide range of application, this model of a generic pre-industrial city has been criticized for oversimplification and overextension. So Joburg's model is most appropriate in cities where domination by an elite occurred. So he identified Three social groups with social boundaries, ruggedly defined and often formally codified. 
So this is the plan of Venta Celorium or the Kerouet. So the town dates from AD 75 and was founded to replace a tribal hill fort situated on high ground a mile to the northwest. The settlement covered an area of 44 acres, 18 HA, and typically was divided into by the main east-west street that was lined with shops and run between the two main gates. So this would be for the first part of our discussion. It will be further elaborated by Ms. Marinel Gabutan. Thank you and God bless. Hello everyone, I am Abigail Marnelli J. Kabutan and I am here to continue the reporting about um, urban geography content of uh, urban systems. So the commerce of the middle, medieval town and trade is exemplified in German Lübeck. So founded in 1159 by the Duke of Saxony in order to attract merchants from neighboring lands. And you know what? Uh, the the product the following products like first and forest products which along with local salt for um they are used for preserving fish and meat were distributed throughout northern europe in exchange for cloth and other manufacturer manufacturers sorry so as you can see in the figure or in the image the town had a medieval cathedral and monasteries but it was dominated by the central marketplace so Many cities such as Venice and Nuremberg annex large areas of their surrounding um, lands to guarantee food supply. So a rural urban symbiosis that remains common in um, modern China. So next, the preconditions of industrial urbanisms. In here, industrial revolution is complex. Um, a, a complex series of innovations emerged in Britain during mid 18th century. So why is it important to consider the innovations? Because it helps seek for what it would cost the city and how it benefits the city in the long run. So medieval Europe, profit, profit was an alien concept among artisans. The price of a product was fixed by adding to the cost of materials the fair value of one's labor. And in the absence of profit, it is defined as the excess of the selling price of goods over their cost. So as you can see in the figure 3.2, the, the oval shaped Renaissance period piazza, San Pietro in Rome, um, constructed by Bernini in 1656 to symbolize the all embracing power of the church and is a potent expression of the link between architecture and ideology. Moving on, let's have early mod modern urbanism. So the economic and political powers of the European medieval city was um, were is usurped by the expansion of nation states. So there are three main phases identified. First, in the 1500 to 16, 1650, the period of general prosperity, the urban growth was widely distributed. So during 1650 to 1750, population growth slowed in response to um, social calamities like um, societal calamities and um, such as war, plague, and famines combined with cyclical downturn in the economy as a result of rising labor cost, falling, re uh, falling rent, incomes from property and technological stagnation. During 1750 to 1800, new urbanization or growth of smaller cities rise and new cities to the urban system. Okay, so let's have here the form of industrial cities. Here, the rise of industrial capitalism. Core. So by 1800, London was the largest city in the world. Then um, industrial capitalism also brought a major realignment of social structures with the creation of two main classes, specifically the capitalist who invested in labor with the goal of realizing a profit and next the labor that sold, uh, sold its skills to the owner of capital in return for a wage. So as you can see in the um, the figure, social segre segregation of the classes, the board joining of um, populations of the 19th century industrial cities placed an enormous strain on urban services and infrastructure, of course. So public sanitation and water supplies were inadequate and often non-existent in the slums. Next would be the residential segregation. So first, 
House building was undertaken by speculative builders who were rarely interested in building for the lower end of the market. Second, the development of residential segregation was a result of individual locational decisions within the context of a rapidly expanded urban um, population. And third, the process of residential differentiation was also influenced by the development of commercial and industrial areas within the city. Fourth, the national and local governments affected residential development in several ways. So, see in the uh, figure 3.6, more generally, Pooley on 1979 provides a model that summarizes the processes of residential sorting by social class in the 19th century British city. So, of course, uh, about housing the poor, Recognizing the differences between various places and continental regions with regard to housing systems and consequent social patterns in industrial cities. So the other side of the coin, it mean uh, it talks about how elite classes were placed in industrial cities, and many of Britain's industrial cities were characterized by market social political differentiation. So that's it, everyone for. Uh, my part of this report so uh, th the next report will be up to uh, miss diane kinoyog so thank you so good day again this is diane kinoyog and we will continue with the discussion of the westward progress of urbanism so major obstacle to westward settlement was the difficult transportation links back to the main markets of the eastern seaboard so the importance of developments in transport technology for the expansion of urbanism is illustrated by the impact of the construction of the Erie Canal between the Hudson River and Lake Erie. So when the canal reached the obscure village of Buffalo in 1824, so the dissemination of freight cost over 363 miles to the Hudson River led to the construction of 3,400 houses in the following year. So, with the town reaching a population of 18,000 by 1840, so other settlements on the new waterway such as Rochester, Oteca, Syracuse, and principally New York all grew rapidly into prosperous cities. So, Borchert um, has proposed a model of U.S. urban development related to changes in technology. Stage 1, so this is the sailing vessel and the horse-drawn wagon era to 1830. So, throughout the 18th and early 19th um, centuries, the North American economy was based almost entirely on agriculture and the export of staple products. So, the main function of the few cities that existed was mercantile involving the import of manufactured goods from Europe and export of primary produce. For the stage 2, this is the age of steam and the iron rail. So, this lies under 1830 to 1870. So, the proportion of the U.S. population living in urban areas rose from 8% to 23% over the period of 1830 to 70. So, in addition to the continued growth of the cities of the eastern seaboard, which had developed as manufacturing bases and key centers for the commercial exploitation of the development uh, a developing continent, so the most dramatic trend was the spread of urbanism in the Midwest associated with the construction of canals and railways. On the stage 3, which is the age of steam and steel, so 1870 to 1920, so this uh, is where the urban population of the USA experienced a five-fold increase to 41 million and urban development was evident across the continent. For the stage 4, this is the age of the automobile and the air travel. So, this is on 1920 to 1970. So, there is an increase from 47% to 70% of the people living in urban places. 
And for stage 5, the age of the concentration, so this happens on 1972, the present. So there is a decrease in the size of the larger metropolitan areas, a decline in the density of the urban population, and increasing segregation of people in communities according to socioeconomic factors such as class, race, age, or language. Moving on to post-industrial urbanism. So post-industrialism is a show, social process that has had a major impact on the city. So it has its principal characteristics. So we have changes in the economy leading to a focus on the service sector rather than on manufacturing. So second, changes in the social structure that afford greater power and status to professional and technological workers. Next, changes in the knowledge base with greater emphasis on R&D and fourth, greater concern for the impact of technological change and lastly, the advent of advanced information systems and intellectual technology. And we also have the five principal formations of parallel residential and business cities. So these are the luxury areas of the city, the gentrified city, the suburban city, the tenement city, and the abandoned city. Moving on to the post-industrial or the post-modern city. So post-industrialism promoted changes in the form of the late 20th city. So Soja has characterized these trends in terms of six geographies of restructuring. So first, we have the restructuring of the economic base of urbanization. So this involves a fundamental change in the organization and technology of industrial production and the attendant social and spatial division of labor. And the second is the formation of a global system of world cities. So this is the effect of expanding both the outreach of particular world cities, bringing most of the globe within their effective hinterland and their in reach. We also have the changing social structure of urbanism, the rise of the carceral city, and a radical change in urban imagery. And that would be all for my report. Thank you for listening.